Hello and welcome to this video on one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell. This is a man that you may not have heard of, but he won a Nobel Prize, resisted World War I, and left a lasting influence that touched many academic fields long after his death. He is considered favourably by most academics who knew of him before his death such as Noam Chomsky. Bertrand Russell was a strong proponent of free thought, speech, and inquiry. He felt the world should move from philosophy which studied the unknown and unverifiable to one of science, in which we know and can quantify the world, thereby allowing the creative and imaginative to explore it through philosophy and science, thereby advancing it. We left off our video with the death of Lewis Carroll in 1896. Sixteen years prior, on the 18th of May 1872, Bertrand Russell was born. He was the third Earl of Russell. From this, you can probably guess that he was from both a family of substance and came of age in a period where the British Empire still held a considerable amount of influence. How the Mighty Have Fallen Unlike Lewis Carroll, Bertrand Russell was born to an influential and liberal family in their manor Ravenscroft. His parents were Viscount and Viscountess. When we say that his parents were liberal, we do not just mean the liberal for the period, but even by modern standards. His father consented to his wife's affair with the children's tutor, and both were advocates of birth control. Further to this, his father was an atheist, which was radical for the time where, if religion was not a profoundly held belief, it was part of life and routine. His grandmother also advocated for the education of women, which was not done at the time in a regular and even standardised manner. His grandfather had been invited by the Queen to form the British government on two occasions, once in 1840 and once in 1860. This was associated with a long history of close ties with power going all the way back to the Tudors. He was born into a relatively free family that allowed for Bertrand Russell to be given the ability to think and explore to his heart's content as an infant. This meant he was provided for in every way a child could be at the time. It was in 1874 that his mother died of diphtheria, then his sister shortly afterwards, and then in 1876 his father died of bronchitis. Without parents, he was sent to live with his conservative paternal grandparents, one of whom was the former Prime Minister. Unfortunately, he also died in 1878. This left only his grandmother to raise he and his older brother. She was a Scottish Presbyterian and had asked the Court of Chancery, which is similar to the country's High Court of Appeals, to set aside the requirements in the parents' will to raise the agnostic. Although religious, she was also liberal and progressive having accepted Darwinism and supporting Irish home rule. This created an oxymoron or formality and repression of feelings. Although unable to openly discuss his thoughts on the world or on the content of books and authors he read, he had ample time to think. It was in 1890, after reaching conclusions on free will and questioning the validity of religion, that he became an atheist. This is the background in which he reached adulthood. Like others of his time, he found mathematics and philosophy promising as a field and followed what was promising. This was undertaken with a scholarship for the Mathematical Tripos at Trinity College, Cambridge, one of the bigger and more influential centres of learning, both at the time and now. He gained the seventh highest grades as a first class honours student in 1893, and two years later became a fellow. 
and this is the important part of his education background. Before he entered university, he had travelled the world. This covered North America and the European continent. And this is where and when he met his first wife, Alice Pearsall Smith. Sadly, this marriage seemed to fizzle out early on, wherein there was a period of 11 years where they lived and moved separately. Eventually, they divorced to allow Bertrand Russell to remarry. Between marriage and divorce, he had many affairs and some were simultaneous. Many of these women were either influential in their own right or closely associated with the social elite and powerful. Shortly after he became a lecturer in 1896, he published his first study of social science subjects focusing on German social democracy. He then taught on this area at the London School of Economics. Rip off! Oh, Minister, how can you say such a thing? Subsidy is about education, preserving the pinnacles of our civilization. Or oh, haven't you noticed? Don't patronize me, Humphrey. I believe in education too. I'm a graduate of the London School of Economics, may I remind you? <laughs> well, I'm uh, glad to learn that even the LSE is not totally opposed to education. <laughs> Nothing wrong with subsidizing sport. Sport is educational. We have sex education too. Should we subsidize sex, perhaps? Oh, could we? <laughs> In 1898, he began on his intense study of mathematics. It began with an essay on the foundations of geometry. This is how and where he segued into his discovery of Russell's paradox in 1903. We touched on this before when we described how you can prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2 without using mathematics. By this time, he was only 30. He still had another 60 and some years of productivity. Over the next seven years, he wrote another four pieces. One was a philosophical essay about seeing someone experiencing an angina attack. The other three were part of a collaboration with Whitehead called Principia Mathematica. At the end of this period, it was 1910, and he became a lecturer at the University of Cambridge. He was never able to gain the equivalent of tenure called a fellowship due to his anti-clerical or more appropriately, agnostic views. While here, he found his protege, a young man known as Ludwig Wittgenstein, who was of Austrian origin. As might have occurred to you, the world was shifting and big events were stirring around this time. This was the First World War, which was known as the Great War. His protege found himself in a prisoner of war camp in 1918. While he served on the front lines, Bertrand Russell was an active anti-war proponent. Particularly, he held strongly and devoutly a belief that war was wrong. This activity led to him being convicted, and in turn, his dismissal from Trinity College. He had failed to be granted fellowship status because he was not willing to either pretend to be a devout Christian, or at least stating that he was agnostic. He later described the resolution of these issues as essential to his freedom of thought and expression. This conviction had other effects. Not only did he lose his job, but he was fined £1,000. In the currency of today, that would be £5,600. He refused and hoped to be punished with prison, but instead had property seized and sold much like Count Dankula, who had his bank account raided by the government. He was eventually put in prison for six months for advocating for the US not to become involved in the war. This was never going to work after the Lusitania was sunk. At the time, it was claimed that it was a non-military merchant, but recent investigation has found considerable military supplies stowed on board. In some respects, he thought fondly on his time in prison, as he had no distractions and an opportunity to spend time and effort on his own desires. Russell was reinstated to Trinity in 1919, took a sabbatical in 1920 to travel and teach in Japan and China, 
which he remembers fondly, and he then resigned in 1921 after being there for a year. He had an ongoing lecturing role there from 1926, which was known as the Tana Lecturer, and he became a fellow again in 1944 until 1949. His return in 1927 was what gave rise to his book called The Analysis of Matter. Between the wars, he traveled to Russia and, as part of the official delegation to the Soviet Union. This is impressive, but he also met Lenin and dismissed him as an unimpressive and impishly cruel individual. Such was his impression of the father of modern-day communism. Bertrand Russell also raised his concerns about the Soviet Union and what he believed to be clandestine executions, a fact we now know to be true. At the time, his concerns were dismissed. Unlike Russell, his paramour of the time, Dora Black, was enamoured with the Soviets, but strangely, this did not sour their relationship. To support his family at the time, he wrote books on a variety of subjects, primarily physics and ethics. He repeatedly stood as a candidate for the British Parliament for the Labour Party in his constituency. His relationship with his paramour, Dora Black, was such that she became pregnant with the next heir to the name and title. He had inherited this in 1931 when his brother died, without an heir. A year after this, he and Dora broke up due to her affairs and the divorce was finalised in 1936. He resumed teaching as part of the faculty for Trinity College. As alluded to, major events were occurring in Europe. The elephant in the room is the invasion of Poland and World War II. Here, Bertrand Russell initially held to the pacifist view, but Hitler was too much for him, and he accepted the need for war. This is despite events like the Munich Agreement. In 1942, he argued in favour of a moderate form of socialism. This contrasted somewhat with some of the philosophical arguments he had for and against it, and this led to a quote being attributed to him. It reads, I think the metaphysics of both Hegel and Marx plain nonsense. Marx claimed to be science is no more justifiable than Mary Baker Eddy's. This does not mean that I am opposed to socialism. He has and will repeatedly say throughout his life that he believes in a charitable and positive effect that people can have on the world. He felt that strict abeyance to a dogmatic belief was a failure of the mind, that it became a problem, that the mind should think clearly and logically, or it would fall into a hole of perception and vague influence. This could be corrupted or subject to whimsical interpretation. He also pushed a thought worth consideration, even today, about employment and education that philosophy had lost many of its merits, but instead, individuals should seek out the sciences and similar fields that were less subjective, that the world should engage in dialogue, not combative approaches to problem solving. In 1943, he expressed support for Zionism, that is, that Israel should be made its own country for the Jewish population. To quote, I have come gradually to see that in a dangerous and largely hostile world, it is essential to Jews to have some country which is theirs, some region where they are not suspected aliens, some state which embodies what it is distinctive in their culture. He was also an initial proponent of atomic weapons to deter global conflict, like World War I and World War II. He later changed his mind that nuclear weapons were good and accepted that they did not serve the intended purpose as it would only end the world in a fiery hell. In September 1961, at the age of 89, he was jailed again 
for what was called a breach of the peace after taking part in an anti-nuclear demonstration. Throughout the 60s and the 70s, he was a strong opponent of the Vietnam War. This went so far as to become a tribunal investigating the war crimes of American forces in Vietnam. Considering how he felt about Israel, his condemnation in January of 1970 of their actions should come as a surprise. He issued a statement which read, Israel's aggression in the Middle East, and in particular Israeli bombing raids, into Egypt as part of the war of attrition, were wrong. He called for Israel to withdraw to their pre-war borders. Around this time, he also argued that the Arab nations should be free to run their own countries, their own societies and their own cultures to their own ways, that Israel and Palestine should be separated and protected through peacekeeping efforts to prevent war and social disruption. Bertrand Russell also believed, if somewhat in error, of a stationary population. This demonstrated some of his underlying weaknesses. Although well versed in math and philosophy, he was not familiar with agriculture and biology. This is important when we consider some of the massive achievements in food production, which he appears to have a close association with when it regards social well-being and global well-being, having argued that those nations that are less economically successful will become resentful or aggressive towards those that are economically successful, primarily owing to the fact that they will increase their population at a far greater pace, and this will allow them to do so. It might perhaps be one of the more pronounced and arguably flawed arguments that he has put out. In the birthday honours of June 1949, he was awarded the Order of Merit for Britain. In 1950, he was given a Nobel Prize for Literature. He was part of the inaugural conference for the cultural freedoms. This was, somewhat ironically, a CIA-funded anti-communist organisation. The fundamental idea was that through spreading ideas and culture, that the world could combat communism. Of all the things to come out of the Cold War, this might well have been one of the more bizarre but beneficial. In 1952, he divorced his third wife and married his fourth wife. This produced a bit of a schism in his family. After this, his eldest son John became mentally ill, and the problems around this became a source of ongoing problems between he and his former wife Dora Black, at least publicly, despite the number of relationships and relationship breakdowns he had had. He held a strong belief in charity and compassionate relationships. This was continually reiterated in public for the remainder of his life until his death. He died of influenza on the 2nd of February 1970 at his home. He was 97 at the time, and it's estimated his estate was worth roughly £70,000 at the time, or £1.1 million today. Bertrand Russell was a man that not only held to an open mind, free speech and peace, but also developed his own morality and ideas beyond where he began. He refused to let his mind be so open that it would fall out, but not so closed that he would be unwilling to consider an idea. It is a process that we should be emulating today, but many have become unable to grow mentally, or look at a concept, even one they may find objectionable, consider its merits and demerits, and then decide. They are dogmatic, the very thing that he advised against. In his lifetime, he wrote over 60 books and over 2,000 articles. He also produced pamphlets and letters to the editor. 
He felt that philosophy should provide a clear question for science and couch the answer they find in a useful way that for a person it should help guide them to acting with vigour, but with the humility of recognising the uncertainty of their actions and their ability to make that decision without knowing everything. He was at one point asked what message he would leave to the world, if he could leave any, and he had two, one moralistic message and one that was philosophical. Last question. Suppose, Lord Russell, this film were to be looked at by our descendants, like a Dead Sea Scroll in a thousand years' time. What would you think it's worth telling that generation about the life you've lived and the lessons you've learned from it? I should like to say two things. One intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I should want to say to them is this. When you are studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you would wish to believe or by what you think would have beneficent social effects if it were believed but look only and solely at what are the facts. That is the intellectual thing that I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say to them is very simple. I should say, love is wise, hatred is foolish. In this world, which is getting more and more closely interconnected, we have to learn to tolerate each other. We have to learn to put up with the fact that some people say things that we don't like. We can only live together in that way. But if we are to live together and not die together, we must learn a kind of charity and a kind of tolerance, which is absolutely vital to the continuation of human life on this planet. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.